you know how like we have like a lot of posthumous releases like when artists die instead of only relying on like the songs that they made before they died and even like just like the roughs and all of that type of stuff i think they're gonna take it a step further of making records with the ai voice and the fans wouldn't know what up what up what up i'm brand man sean and we are back with the episode of no labels necessary podcast you can catch us streaming on youtube spotify uh well apple music all those great places talking about music money and the content creator economy just entrepreneurship in general we are a podcast where i like to just sum it up it's about artists entrepreneurship and just overall rule breakers because of the industry that we're and the way things are moving these days that's what the no labels really means to me at the end of the day but we got a very special guest for you guys this is patrick in Buemina, director of influencer marketing at Def Jam. Now, this guy right here has been moving. I mean, director of influence and marketing at Def Jam. That's a, you know, that's a big boy title. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's, a, it's a big boy title. Like, and you're pretty you. young. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I don't consider myself old, <laughs> but you pretty damn young. So yeah. I would love to really get into the story of how you got to where you, you are. Um, some of the things that you see from inside the building mm -hmm. and um, just as a whole in the game. So one, if you don't mind, how old are you? I'm 25, just turned 25 like two months ago. Just turned 25 from where? From, uh, what you mean? Where, you, where are you, uh, Atlanta? I'm, ba I'm based in LA, I'm from Atlanta though. From Atlanta? Yeah. Okay. So. 25 year, years old, director of influencer marketing at Def Jam. How does that happen? How does that happen? So uh, long story short, um, I'm going to start back like in college, like take it back there. So we um, in college, I really was trying to um, make some money in college, but I didn't want to work any of the kind of like traditional jobs like the Chick-fil-A job, stuff like that. So I started doing drop shipping, made some money. And the three main like keys that you got to focus on in drop shipping is marketing at that time you couldn't this wasn't like in the TikTok age so this is before then so i was learning like facebook ads instagram ads and influencer marketing so those were the three main things and from there i started working with a bunch of influencers and then i started managing an influencer by the name of king imprint and he does a lot of dance content and a lot of labels and artists would pay him to do dances to their music and this is before TikTok, so this is like youtube instagram he would go viral on those platforms and so from there, I did that for like a year or two. When it was time, like I was about to graduate college, I wanted to work at a label. I wanted to be more in the music industry. So I hit up a bunch of labels. I was applying to a lot of labels. And finally, after like so many months, um, somebody from StreamCut hit me back about an internship interview. Did that interview. Um, they hired me the next day for the internship. A week later, they hired me for a full-time position. I worked there for a couple of years and stream cut on artists like Saucy Santana, Saw Baby, Jakari, Lights Can Keisha, et cetera, et cetera. And then um, Def Jam came around um, with Tunji. He, um, he was looking for an influencer marketing person. And so one of my friends, Daniel, connected me with Tunji and the rest is history. He hired me um, at Def Jam. Now tell me this, right? Things came together. Right. You knew some people, you got to meet some people from reaching out. Right. But you still had to be somebody that they were worth that they wanted yeah. to put on. Right. Yeah. So like, what were you doing? Like, what, what were you doing that you got talked to one day, hired the next day and then basically promoted and, and, and hired for real after a week? Yeah. So um, when I came there, that was actually like they were that week that was the they were doing like the rollout for saucy santana song with lotto up and down and so they were going to be doing like a party bus and having him go to a bunch of different clubs and they wanted to get influencers on a bus and so the funny thing is this was like they already had planned this for like that friday and my interview was on like tuesday or something and they were like um the, i was in an interview with the head of operations and he was talking to me about my background and so i had this whole influencer marketing background of working with a bunch of different influencers and so he had actually ended up bringing in the co-founders into our interview um and like talking to me talk, and they were talking to me about everything and also interviewing me and then telling me about what they're trying to do and they asked could i be able to get influencers on the bus and at the time when i was sitting there i was like 
I really don't think I could pull this off because a lot of the interview, the in influencers I was working with at the time were like younger and like for a club thing, they have to be 21 and older. But um, I was like, yeah, of course I can do it. And so they said, come in tomorrow. And so I got it done. I got influencers on the bus. They um, made a bunch of content. A lot of them had posted like YouTube vlogs of the event. They had posted IG stories, all of that good stuff. It was a great event, great turnout. Um, and so, yeah, they ended up hiring me there um, that next week. And so they really, at the time, they wanted to hire me more so like for marketing, but they asked me kind of just what, what I wanted to do. And so I wanted specifically at the time to be an A&R. So I was like, I can do both because I also wanted to do marketing. So I was an A&R marketing manager there. Mm, got you. Got you. So what I'm hearing is, I don't know, you you got yourself into music. Yeah. Really not with a full plan of getting into music because you like found your way into it at first, right? But then you had a vision or did you, cause it didn't sound like you like came out of college specifically saying I want to do music cause you did the drop shipping and all that other stuff, right? No, nah, so I mean, the interesting thing, um, there's like this quote from like Steve Jobs where he's like, uh, you can really only connect the dots looking back. Mm -hmm. I had saw like a year or two, I think it was like while I was in stream cause I was looking through my notes. I like type everything in my notes, things I want to do and all of that. And I saw like a note that was like super old that I put, it was like, um, look for a, apply for um, music label internships. But this was like the semester going, like the summer before I was going into college. Dang. Mind you, I was going to college for like to be a lawyer. Like I was an econ major, sociology minor. That's what I was in college for. But I think in the back of my mind, I always wanted to be in the music industry, but I didn't see it as a real thing at that time because I really had zero connections into it. But as I got into like the whole dropshipping thing and then the influencers and kind of got more into that space, I could see it for myself. And that's when I tried to like really go hard after it. And so, yeah, that's how that kind of came about. Now, have you always had that drive and look to do something different? Because we got a little information <laughs> Someone is saying that in high school you were a go-to smart guy. If you wanted to get some info, you know, you wanted to get your homework right, you were somebody to talk to. And apparently, I think you might have had like a, a merch brand or some clothes or something you sold at some point. Did I? So I did a lot. I, I always did things like to make money. Like that always. wasn't the like. Oh, I did actually though. I mean, he hustled um, so much. He only remember your <laughs> I think that was also though around like college. Um, but I did sell a bunch of. So I started this uh, nonprofit organization, like a five hundred one c three and everything like that, while I was in college. And I wasn't necessarily doing that to make money, but I did um, sell like a bunch of. I made some. I had my brother actually. He's a designer. I had him design some sweatshirts, and then I sold those to like raise money for a lot of the different stuff that mm -hmm. we was doing. Um. But yeah, so that was one of the um, things that I did. And yeah, I think that's what they'll be talking about. So, but yeah, I mean, even in high school, like I was always very planned out with everything that I wanted to do. Like when I decided in middle school that I wanted to be a lawyer, in high school, I did like three different law internships at like law firms. Like I was like on that path, that's what I wanted to do. So I was gonna figure it out. So whenever like I kind of set my mind to something, I'm like zoned in on it. That's what's up, which is why that director of influence marketing at Def Jam <laughs> has happened at such a young age, yeah, right? And you still you. got more moves, you still got more plans. Quick second, have you ever seen an artist catch some traction and then they start to move? The numbers start to grow, they might even go viral, but then fast forward a year from now, somehow their numbers haven't really grown that much. They dropped back close to the same monthly listeners they had before the traction and viral moment. Well, that's because you have to know how to convert those moments into careers. And we've done this again and again with not only songs, but artists. And so has J.R. McKee, who's been a part of helping artists like Lil Durk, Rod Wave, Justine Sky and Money Long. And we just did a collab where J.R. McKee does a step-by-step -step breakdown of how he took Money Long from zero to millions of monthly listeners and winning a Grammy over Beyonce, Mary J. Blige, and Jasmine Sullivan. Check out this breakdown while we still have it up. You can check it out at www.brandmannetwork.com slash Grammy. Don't forget the www or it won't work. Again, that's www.brandmannetwork.com slash Grammy. Grammy, back to the video. I want to ask you a little bit more about the the inner workings of the marketing department of the label, mm -hmm. right? Just so people can understand 
I, what are the general departments and what are their, um, what are the things that they're in control of? Yeah, so you have like, um, you have your, your digital marketing team. And so your digital marketing team is gonna have people that do like um, CRM email marketing. They're also like doing, um, like me, influencer marketing. You have your digital marketing managers and they kind of head the artists like full on digital marketing that's getting them different um, activations to do with their releases and kind of helping on the digital side of planning their rollout. And then on the main marketing side, you have the product manager who's like the overall product manager and oversees everything like um, all of the different departments um, with also just helping the full scale rollout. Um, you have press um, who handles like the different like getting them interviews, whether it's with like the Breakfast Club or um, podcasts like Drink Champs, different things like that, or even just like written press and online press. Um, you have radio team. Um, you have, that's called promotions at, uh, labels. What else is there? It's a bunch of different departments, basically just covering everything to like give every project the like right um, rollout and right release. And also just to give that kind of artist development that um, that's needed. Do y'all use all those things for every artist project or is it really touch and go? I mean, it depends on where the artist is at. Uh, when you have like a lot of developing acts, it wouldn't make sense for like to start out with trying to get certain um, high level interviews, right? You might work with, you'll definitely like still use press, but it's gonna be um, what makes sense for the artist, right? You might use uh, radio, but it may be what makes sense for the artist. And sometimes if it's a really like early act, it doesn't make sense for them to be on radio at that time. So it really just depends on where the artist is at. But like, if it's a really priority artist, it's all hands on deck. You're definitely exhausting every resource, um, but it just depends. But the goal is to get them to that place where it's always gonna be all hands on deck. Do you think artists understand what it takes to become a priority in a label? No, I don't think they do. I think every artist assumes that they're a priority at the label because of what might be what told that? to them when they're signed or something. What, so what does that conversation look like, right? Like, like walk us through the, what is the, just taking the artist through that realization, like what does it look like? I mean, I think with labels, you can only like, especially when you only work in certain departments, it's like it's not necessarily even your job to say certain things. But I think with certain artists and even sometimes their teams just being there, they have a problem with being realistic of where they're at. And like the problem is because they're looking at other artists get certain things right and like be on certain platforms. And they're like, well, if this artist is um, doing a. I'm not going to say a specific thing because, yeah, <laughs> but if this artist is doing this thing, why can't I do it? I'm bigger than him or I feel like I'm on the same level with him. Or if this artist is getting this certain interview, look, why can't I get it? Or if X, like that's kind of like a lot of what happens and people don't understand certain times. It's like it just might not make sense for you and where you're at. And like it's got you're going to get there like it's it's a marathon, not a sprint. And sometimes even just with what I do with influencer marketing and, and putting people on blogs and stuff like that, you might not want to be, have that look so early because they're going to be negative in the comments. Mm -hmm. And I've seen a lot of times where it's like a, a team or artist is super advocating to get a certain post on a certain blog, right? And then they get that post and it doesn't do good numbers or everybody's being negative. And I'm like, it, I, I kind of knew that was going to happen. So it's like sometimes, but sometimes you just got to do it just so they can see. And yeah, sometimes, facts. you know, you just like, we just, we're just not gonna do it at that time. It just depends. Yeah, cause, and that's even what made me ask, cause I feel like once an artist gets to the stage where, to the stage where the label is ready to spend marketing yeah. dollars, that's usually when they learn, right? Oh, yeah. I got 5K and this other artist got 500K, or <laughs> yo, y'all are down to get him 10 academics posts, y'all won't even <laughs> get me one say cheese post, right? And I mean, we do the same thing. Like usually if it's something where we feel like the artist is sensitive, we'll let the, the influencer said, right? Oh, yeah. wow, this shit kind of mid. Hey, bro, X says kind of mid. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And there ain't too much we can do about that. <laughs> <laughs> so I, yeah, I was just kind of wondering, like, if, if y'all were seeing the same thing, like, those are the same conversations kind of coming up. It, it's definitely those conversations that come up all the time. And I think um, people like lose sight of like what a label is supposed to be doing because they assume that, um, and what they're supposed to be doing on there. And they assume when they sign that, okay, the job is finished. And now that's really where it gets started. You got to make sure that you're a priority at the label and you shouldn't really just be relying on them to push you. Cause I tell, I tell a lot of people all the time, it's like, if you're not even posting about your music, why do you want us to be spending so much money on other people post to post about your music? Like 
that doesn't make sense. Yeah. And like, you need to be like making us feel like you feel like this is the best thing in the world. And if you're not even doing that on, on your end, you can't really be expecting us to be trying to spend this much money to do this type of campaign or that type of campaign. Like, show us that you actually care about the music first. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. So what's the what's the most you, you've seen me spent on an influencer campaign? Like, what's, And what kind of came from it? You don't have to say the artist. Okay, okay yeah, cool. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we did a campaign for an artist, um, and they gave me a very large budget. Um, and we did, like, everything. We did, like, Instagram seeding, we did a Twitter campaign, we did set up a Discord, we try to do like a Reddit campaign, and then also, of course, like a TikTok influencer campaign. And um, with the tw TikTok campaign, it was a successful campaign. The sound has like over like a billion views on the sound, over um, half a million creates on the sound. I think last time I checked, it was like super successful. Like mm -hmm. the more you spend on uh, TikTok, has become super saturated, but um, you can still have successful campaigns the more money you spend on it. But the less you spend now, it's like it's a toss up if you're going to have a successful campaign. But if you get a lot enough money, you can definitely like make something go viral on TikTok easily. Like if you've ran so many campaigns, it's like not that hard if you have a lot of money to do it. Yeah. And so in, in that to your point, like in that campaign where, where you have this large budget, do you feel like, well, actually, before I even ask, I'm going to ask, was that artist like active? making content like did y'all have like were they a super active artist i mean when you're at a certain level you don't have to be like active can mean a lot of different things depending on where you are in life so like you're active maybe making one post and that post is going to yeah. do way more than somebody who needs to make 20 30 posts yeah, that's true that's so true. like if you even get one post out of a person at a certain place that's even more than you need <laughs> yeah. you know yeah. yeah that's true that's true okay because yeah, I, I was gonna ask just like send the, cause you made the point of like sometimes you feel like it's, it's you know it's, it's weird that they are willing to spend so much money on getting on other people's platforms yeah. when they're not even putting the, the work in to build their own platform. And this is something me and Sean talk about a lot, and we get yeah. into arguments with clients about like, yo man, you would rather spend ten k to get on these pages versus saving that ten k building your own platform, exactly. and then to your point, doubling back when people know you and, and making exactly. kind of hit. So. I guess what what I the question I want that to lead into is is do you do you guys kind of have a bar for when you start introducing influencer campaigns into an artist marketing campaign or you know I know with influencer it tends to be very like a lot of times like moment based or kind of like you know I, idea based but like at what point are y'all looking at y'all rosters and saying like okay now it makes sense to do some type of influencer campaign I mean it um we took. We're kind of, I think this year, I'm taking like more so kind of a different approach with it. I mean, everybody has their like respective budgets for uh, when it's, um, when they're releasing something. And so like for me, like the budget I'm giving for the release is either going to go towards like uh, seeding it out on blogs, it's going to go towards doing like a TikTok campaign or a Twitter campaign or whatever I think makes sense. So like I base it off of what I think is effective for this release. Um, and that's kind of what we do, but also what they have to spend on it. And then if I feel very more like adamant about something, like I really think we should spend more on this or do this type of thing here, and we don't have enough in that budget, then we like figure it out on what exactly we need to do. But it's really just about the specific release and seeing what we need to do as far as if it's like just a more so like a developing artist and there's like limits. If it's like a bigger artist, we're gonna do like multiple of those types of things and have the room to do it like effectively. So it just depends. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. You, you want to stay on that same subject because I wanted to pull up a clip real quick and just get the get your opinion, you know, for our regular format. So here's a clip of DJ Khaled caption. <laughs> Some of these artists have it confused. You don't work hard enough. Let's hear DJ Khaled talk. Artists got it confused. Y'all don't work hard enough. I got people coming to me talking about I work work boy i ain't have instagram i ain't have twitter when i came in the game i had the word of the mouth when i came in new york funk flex cypher and ebo let me on the radio and let me dj for 30 minutes and guess what i woke the city up people recorded that show to this day they talk about it i'm risking my life to get my name out but guess what 
I wouldn't stop. They said, you see that boy DJ Khaled? We didn't have Instagram or a blog for them to see it. But the word of mouth in the streets talked about it. That's how I came up. Going city to city. You heard that boy Khaled? That boy Khaled crazy. That boy Khaled got a talk game. That boy Khaled rips any club down. These new artists, they got Instagram. They got the morning show that the minute the interview's done, it's on the mother internet the biggest promotion so you got the outlet to be great and you out here thinking you cool y'all crazy <laughs> i would love to know your thoughts on that clip uh no nah, I, I totally agree with him and i feel like people have it easier now with so much social media like you have access to one of the things i see with a lot of artists is that they like to do this mystique thing where they're like i don't want to um I don't want to post anything on my page and I just want to be like mysterious. And I'm like, one, it's a different age Two, nobody cares about you. Nobody knows you. So it's like, it's just not going to work like that. We're like more in a time where people want to know so much about your personal life and all of that stuff. It's like, unless you're already at a certain stage, it's near impossible trying to use that as a marketing strategy and thinking mm -hmm. that you're going to just get people to care about what you're doing. Like you have to like literally be active on the TikTok, on Instagram, on all of these platforms, even like creating a discord or just um, being in Reddit communities, whatever it is. But you got to um, even being on Twitch, it's like there's Twitch streamers who are putting out music who have like more monthly listeners than actual artists. A lot. So like you, you really just got to people care more about like what you're doing in your personal life sometimes more than the music and it just helps supplement it but um we see a lot of artists that don't want to do that work they just want the label to do the work for them and post about them so what do y'all do about that when y'all feel like an artist is in that place i mean it's a case-by-case -case basis and i think sometimes it also depends on the music because some artists it's like they have really good music and it could make sense. And it also, they might have more of like a personality where it's like, I could see this working. And some artists it's like, no, you're gonna need to really actually like lean in on these platforms and make it work. Um, like it really just depends on, on the artist by artist cases, but we still like harp on them that they gotta put out content. They really like, and we help them with like making those plans and like helping them with ideas of what to post. It really just depends. And like, even with me, if it's a certain artist I really like fuck with and I think that they could really be like successful and I really just like have that like dedication or feeling like, okay, I really wanna like help them out. I'll like literally like personally like, and it's not in my job that I have to do it, but like directly like talking to them and like helping them and like giving them these different like links of sounds to do like weekly or whatever, just like whatever they need, whatever questions they have, just like making the process easier for them. So that we can get that done. But I really don't have the ability to do that for like every artist because I work on all of the artists at our label. So how, no, I'll say this way. So what percentage of the time do you think an artist is genuinely lazy versus just doesn't get it? Like what it actually takes and what it actually looks like? That's a good question. I think it's both though. And I would say, like, I think um, how I answer this, though, I think I think 70 percent of the artists are just like lazy. But I also think that comes with not understanding what it takes to because it's like you also one thing I've seen um, in general with working with artists is that they don't realize what actually like goes into like putting out records and like what goes into making records like really like successful and big. They don't really see, even with like people who have records that go viral on TikTok, they don't see that this person had to literally be making two, three, four hundred TikTok posts before when it's an independent artist, like not like doing a campaign, like that organically weren't viral. It wasn't just off this one post that they made on their page. They had been on TikTok for like a minute and they were trying out a lot of different stuff on their sounds and really like trying to put it together and figure it out. But some people just see a bunch of TikTok sounds come up and be popular and think that, oh, this happened overnight. And it's, it's it's just really not the case. But I think they just don't really get it, what it takes, to be honest. Yeah. yeah I mean, I, to me, I find oftentimes laziness is a lack of understanding in many ways. Yeah. Right. Just like we can all get to it in different things like, hey, man, like 
business, a lot of stuff and to do with what I got to do for work, I get right on top of it. But then you tell me there's like a little bit of leak, you know, at the house somewhere. Yeah. It might take a little bit longer to get to that. Right? Yeah. It's, just, it's, not, it's just not my area. And I think for a lot of artists, they just it's just not their area. You got to yeah. take time to get it because that leak could create a big issue. Right. Yeah. And so it's on me if something explodes or something like that. But once I understand that that can happen and that might like and 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 it could happen within a week's time, yeah. then I'll start to take the right level of action. And I think a lot of artists is just it's well, I mean, how do you get this understanding? Because we create an environment where yeah. everything feels like magic anyway. <laughs> Like yeah. that's kind of what we're supposed to do. So we're we actually don't want you to have that understanding. That's true. Yeah, at the same time, you know, you kind of get into this space where well now you you don't have the benefit. I always say like you don't got the benefit of like thinking like a fan yeah. no more and seeing the world the way they do. Now yeah. if you want to be in this, but I mean, because it's just a totally different perspective. So I mean, with all that in mind, I actually want to transition is something can i add on to that yeah, real yeah, quick go ahead, go ahead. okay yeah let me add on to that because that kind of reminded me of something to that point of like the laziness and sometimes not understanding i think even with some artists their understanding of me doing what i need to be doing is like being in the studio every day and like making a bunch of music and perfecting my sound and doing all of that right. and i think that's cool and all but i think the person that goes farther is the person that's like okay i'm gonna work on this one song make sure it's a hit song and then spend so much time on like YouTube and all of these different things, watching marketing vi videos and figuring out how I'm actually going to push this song effectively and like pushing this one song for several months. If you feel like it's that hit song, if it's not the right one and you've like exhausted, really like trying to market it in so many ways. And I'm not even talking about paid marketing, but you've exhausted everything and it's just not connecting, maybe moving on to that next record and trying it with that. But I think that person goes a lot farther than the person who's like, I'm just gonna put out a bunch of music and be in the studio and think that somebody's gonna eventually hear it. Cause it's like, that's in today's day and age with so much music coming out, that's usually not the case. So sometimes there is a lack of understanding of where I should put my time and how to do it. But we have so many free online resources like YouTube and like even y'all's platform where y'all talk so much about how to effectively market stuff. So I think that's part of it, knowing where to put your time. Yeah, yeah. That's a big statement. So, I mean, well, actually, you kind of broke it down, like knowing where to put your time, even just focusing on that one record. Uh, did you have to learn that? And if so, what made you realize how time gets best allocated towards the artists who make it mm -hmm. to a certain level versus the ones you see struggling? Yeah, I think um, the beauty of when I was working at Stream Cut, I got to literally do everything from literally like <laughs> I was doing like even like typing in the metadata to submit it uh, for our, all of our different releases. But like, of course, signing artists, being in the studio, helping develop their sound and um, like working with producers, getting them to um, our artists to write records, literally to being on set with our artists, making sure they're like making content, getting the behind the scenes stuff, making them make TikToks while we're there, like having, having all this stuff set for our releases. And then I was also working on all of the marketing rollouts for all of our artists at the label. Um, even doing like the pitching for playlisting, like writing up those type of stuff. I literally like, and even also doing publishing, I did every kind of different thing. So I knew all that it kind of took. And the artists that made it farther at an independent label like that were the artists who were willing to actually just put in the time and do it. One of the things that we focused a lot at Stream Cut was, was on TikTok and it was at a really good time. I started there March, 2020. So that was like the beginning of the pandemic. And that's when TikTok really spiked a little bit, um, spiked a lot, actually. But we forced that on all of our artists so much um, beyond just like us doing campaigns, but like literally having them post on their platforms. And I think you'll see with a lot of the artists that came from Stream Cut that they're super active on TikTok at this time. So it's like the Young Baby Tates of the world, the Lottos of the world, Saucy Santana's of the world, um, Jakari, Light Skin Keisha. Um, there's like a lot of those people who have a lot of like different viral TikTok records because that's one of the things that we kind of pushed heavy was like uh, posting literally consistently on TikTok. And then we got to ourselves basically more chances of making things go on TikTok. And um, just also at that time, I was running a lot of the campaigns myself um, as far as like in the early stages of like 
from ground level, I would be like doing a lot of the TikTok campaigns. And if anything kind of like broke, then we would scale it um, to like bigger agencies at that time and stuff like that, because I have my own agency. And I got to spend a lot of money on like seeing the effective ways to like run TikTok campaigns at that time. And because it was early, we had a lot more success. I think even at that time, we ended up having a lot of our artists on the end of the year TikTok list because we were just heavily focused on that. Okay. Okay. See, so yeah, especially, I mean, you're talking about 2020. That was the time. Yeah. That was the time for real, for real. Okay. So I, with your role, right, and looking at the, what do you call it? The, I mean, the executive suite. When I look at the labels, I've noticed the way people move in the music world is a lot different than a lot of traditional corporations in terms of like going from label to label and yeah. team to team. And then they might end up back to the same team. Like I think a good example would be uh, Amber Grimes, right? Like I remember she, I don't even know all the different positions, but then, yeah. she, then she back at LVRN, right? Yeah. And it was within a short period of time. Mm -hmm. But how do you view the naval lab, the label navigation system for you know the people who are in it, right? And, and, and young professionals and depending on what they're trying to achieve in their career. I think it really like the label game in general first, it's like one thing to even get in it and it's hard to even break that barrier of getting in the music industry. But to be honest, it's harder to stay in the music industry if you're not really like consistently like having wins and really building relationships you're not going to really get too far and you don't want to I'm gonna say that. Um, <laughs> you're not um, going to get too far, but you really got to, if you're trying to navigate to a different place, right? Mm -hmm. You want to have like recent wins. You want to have like um, good relationships because that's one of, that's what's going to get you that next job, especially if you're in a place where it's like, you could be um get if you get fired right let's like say you get fired because sometimes that happens and it's like sometimes it's not even like your fault there might be just like mass layoffs and stuff like that if you don't have like uh these recent wins or you don't have like this good network it's gonna take you a minute to find a job because i don't really what i've learned is like is very at least to me from my perspective it's very impossible to get a job by applying to them <laughs> like on their like things really that usually to me it doesn't happen um it's like more so a thing of where it's like your connections and relationships are letting you know okay somebody's looking for this or mm -hmm. somebody's looking for that or you see this posted and you know people that work at that label and then you hit them up about it and that kind of gets you more of a better position positioning and getting that job you might still of course have to you will still of course have to do those interviews but you already got that like one up on the other people who might be more qualified. And I mean, yeah, I think the, as you continue to build your resume though, you have more recruiters and people hitting you up for like different positions and stuff. But in that like stretch of like first getting into it, it's more about relationships. It's interesting you say that, especially the recent wins, because I, as I learn more about Sports, so I got some homies that work for sports teams. Um, and then hearing about the label systems and how y'all work is very similar where, like, let's say the win, the, the team wins the Super Bowl this year, mm. all right? And then the reason it gets so hard to, to get another one because half the damn team leaves because they get promoted, right? Oh, the yeah. offensive coordinator and now head coach over here. And now mm. this person got picked over to be the head of recruiting over there, right? That type of thing happens. Be because those are those moments where you get those advancements. If you don't get a win, like, in the, or there's no big wins within the, uh, you know, uh, the company, yeah. then like nobody's really getting promoted like that. It's, it's often going the other way. So, like, it sounds very similar because I started to learn that when we had some uh, some major wins early on, and you know, we weren't anywhere near label systems, yeah. those relationships, and we found out. Well, like a year or so later, like for one in, in particular, Corey knows what I'm talking about, where they were like, man, like we were trying to figure out who was responsible for that. Because yeah. we knew nobody in the label was actually <laughs> like behind this artist at the time, but yeah. we made the artist go crazy, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's like, dang, so that would have been the time where we probably could have escalated 
a lot of different yeah we could have capped a lot of different relationships yeah. and things like that but we were just so i don't even want to say just anti-industry we were just doing our own thing you know? oh, yeah yeah you know, you know moving <laughs> i mean it, it's not a problem with being anti-industry because a lot of the times the industry can make you want to be anti-industry especially when you like are really like really in it yeah. and you um even for a long time i didn't feel like i was a part of the industry but i mean that's another story but I feel like when you get into it and you kind of see how it is, you you don't like it as much as you would think. Honestly, sometimes it makes you want to leave <laughs> and, and get out of it. But I think also it's too, it's just about really just when like to your point of like when those big wins happen, a lot of people leave. It's like it just depends on what makes sense for you at that time and really what your goals are. Like even like just. Um, like a couple months ago, a label hit me up about a, another major label hit me up about a VP position, but that's not necessarily like something I'm like really pursuing or anything, but, um, it just, it really depends on like where you're trying to go and what you're trying to do, um, with where you're at. And if it's like, put opportunities don't come like just flooding all the time. So if it's like, this is what I want to do at that time. And it's the right time, you know, go for it. You know, hopefully you have your blessing from your peers and usually you should, but um, it just depends on what, what, it, what it feels like at that time. Do you find that most people are pretty supportive? Like, like, every, like the, the general culture is like, hey, you get yours, I'm, I'm trying to get mine. Because I feel like, I mean, I don't know, because this is music and, the, and it's like a different type of weird interpersonal friendship mentality that kind of gets assumed and exists in in um, music more than like a general corporation but i know mm -hmm. like the corporate world all my my people i know who work in like regular corporate they um it's almost like hey get yours get whatever you can because <laughs> it's like we all just trying to get ours from the man damn near you know what i yeah. mean like is it that type of mentality in music or is it sometimes people feel like oh man you you leaving me or you know, how does that go? I think it really depends on how you move and like the relationships that you build because everybody has their own like agenda in the music industry. Sometimes it feels like, but like for me, I value like relationships more. And so like, I'm never like, if something isn't just the right time to do it, I'm not gonna necessarily do that. Or if it just doesn't feel right with my relationship with certain people, I'm not gonna do it at that time. Or I'm gonna be specific about how I do that and doing it in a way that it makes sense. But I think um, a lot of people don't do that in this industry. And I think a lot of people just kind of more so do what's best for them. And I mean, you know, that's not a long-term, that's not a great long-term thing to do. Um, but you know, everybody's different, you know? So I'm just saying. Yeah. Yeah. All right, now with that being said, I wanna play this other clip. Nah, I'm not gonna play that other one. I'm kinda wild for that one. <laughs> you guys see that Instagram is gonna be charging eleven ninety nine a month. And Twitter already charged it. Elon set the precedent. You want that blue check? No problem. Eight bucks. It's not just Instagram, it's Facebook too. It's meta. meta. In order to get your account verified, the name on your Facebook is gonna have to match the name on your ID. Lil Ricky, spelled with, <laughs> with a, the number one and a three, it's not on your identification. So that's problem number one. Hmm. No businesses. So all that paying for your business to get verified, to get, you know, impersonator support and all that's out the window. So all them different pages you created where you didn't know if you were a business, a creator, an entrepreneur, the tooth fairy, the Easter bunny, all of that's going to come back to bite you in the ass. But you're going to have to provide business information, which means you're going to have to link a bank account to it, which means that you're going to have to ultimately get an EIN, which means that all them days of freeloading and hanging out and all these days of people just running ads up on you and taking all your money and all, all those days are done for. It's done ski. Now... They they said a lot of different things there. Yeah. The part I want to focus on actually is first, since you do so heavy in the influencer world, is do you think the value of Instagram, uh, Twitter, Twitter, yeah, doing these purchase verifications is going to mess up the idea of being verified? Period. Yeah, I think it it waters it down a lot. Um, like even just a lot of influencers and celebrities like been posting on their story about how they don't like it in general. And I think it definitely like waters it down. Um, but I think honestly, shout out to like Elon Musk cause everybody looked at him crazy when he rolled it out for Twitter and now like Instagram is following it. So it must be working on their side, but um, yeah, I think it kind of waters it down. 
The funny thing is to me about the whole like verification thing is that, and I know y'all know this, of course, but like a lot of people pay for verification. You just didn't know it um, because it was more of like a behind the scenes thing. And they paid way more. more. They paid, they paid thousands, people paid thousands of dollars for verification. And so like, (laughs) it's funny now that it's like a a whole thing of, oh, you paying for a blue check, you paying for a blue check. It's just like people didn't know it. And honestly, they're paying like, I mean, I would never really do that. I really don't. People have different reasons for why they do it. And cool, shout out to them. But um, yeah, I mean, it's not a thing that's never been done. Like people were paying a lot more for it. Actually, I, I'm glad you brought up that point. I hadn't even thought about that one, but you know, I've, I've heard situations of like 30 bands yeah, for it can get up there. you know. Um, but it's funny because you're like, I'm mad somebody I'm mad that they're making me pay ten dollars a month. I'd rather pay that thirty thousand. So what you're telling me, right, is that gap between that ten dollars a month and that thirty thousand, that brand equity and brand perception is so strong that it's worth it. Now maybe it is, but that would have to be the argument. That's the only reason you would be mad about it. Yeah, but it is worth that. I think um, if everybody's verified, then nobody's verified. So like if you I would be heated if I just paid like 10K, 20K, 30K for blue check and now like people paying for it for ten dollars. The good thing though is that you still have like whatever username that you have so people know that it's um you had it before this, but at the same time it's still like watered down now. You know what? That shit happened so fast <laughs> now that I think about it. That was like three weeks ago, I feel like like a month when it felt like it really got rolled up. Twitter? Up. Twitter was like two, three months ago, right? Yeah. And they announced it maybe yeah. only like maybe four weeks before Max. Yeah. Yeah. So this happened so fast, that had to fuck a lot of people's business up. <laughs> Cause they you know we know the you know yeah. a lot of people that that was their business or yeah, that's one of the services they offer. Yeah, that offer was the one service. that was bringing the money. Hey, <laughs> I'm just saying. A lot of publicists in pain right now. A lot of, lot of, lot of hurt publicists. That's really interesting. But I mean, the the support feature they've added to it has been pretty interesting because mm-hmm. Meta or Instagram at least never had like a real like true support system, right? Yeah. And now they have like the whole hacking thing. Now you can hit them if you got you got yeah. your account hacked. You can just ask them general questions. Like I would hit my Instagram rep, you know, ask just, just to see if they get back to me. Hey, what's the best time to post? Yeah. Stupid question. You know what I'm saying? To see what they say. <laughs> they respond? Yeah, respond back to me like because they said they respond within at least 24 hours. They got back to me within like 15. You know. Oh, that's not bad. Hey, some, look at our Instagram tips about posting. Here's the link to it. I, which I feel them. You know what I'm saying? I would have <laughs> I would have done, done the same thing, but I was like, oh shit, they actually responded back. You know what I'm saying? So I think like it's a it's a couple of things about it. That I do think are valuable that is yeah. that is not getting talked about. Like everyone's kind of focusing on like the social capital aspect, but it's mm-hmm. like, but what about all the other things that Meta would have never done if they didn't figure out a paywall for it? I think the best one was like that I heard was the engagement. They give you better uh, engagement on it. I think that's the main thing that because Instagram has really been like kind of cutting back on the like how they push out your content. So I think if anything, that's the best thing to kind of use it for. That, I keep forgetting that part, and that's the only reason I'll go ahead and pay for one. <laughs> Obviously, because of how what we do, how we move. But that and the support, bro. Like, I ain't ever worried about getting hacked, but it's just knowing I could go to them now. If I got hacked. Yeah. Well, you know they done made fake brand man profiles <laughs> like twice now. So, all right. So, all right. This, this verification thing, I think, one, is a good thing from a standpoint of it's actually returning to the actual reason they started it, yeah. right? Which is just literally verifying identity. And if I was Elon or somebody and was like, wait, people are paying for this anyway and we and we not getting the money? <laughs> like people making money on your block and y'all not getting the money while y'all struggling to get, capture revenue. Yeah. Like, come on. So now we got this revenue stream we can be more in control of versus just waiting on advertisers and things like that. So they're like, that's, there's that. Um, and then like, I wish I thought about uh well we didn't go too deep down this hole while Sam was here. But he was just talking about like why the advertisers pulled out. Oh yeah. And it's like it doesn't make sense either. Yeah. Cause I'm not gonna stop giving you money because you hired you fired your team. And look, cause if you still give me the same service yeah. and I'm getting the same results, yeah. I'm gonna be like, I mean shit. Well, cool, tough, tough for them, you know what I mean? <laughs> but 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 anyway, so 
the the thing I hate the worst though of all this that I feel like they didn't have to do. They could have brought all these things, you know, these benefits. This whole that I've been hearing from Jacory and others that they're sending in notifications to other people that you got Twitter, uh, Facebook, Meta Verified mm-hmm. or whatever. Like that part. Corn. Oh, that's a little bit too much, man. Yeah. You ain't have to tell my business that I that I got this, right? <laughs> I don't I didn't even get it, but I would feel I would feel, you know, Embarrassed. revealed, man. Yeah. You know, like, you know, I wouldn't say full on embarrassed, but it, <laughs> it, would, it would just it would just be like, why you gotta do that, right? I don't like people knowing that I like something. I was like, I'm one of those yeah. people, right? Like, I, <laughs> you see it when you see it. So they really they they really are killing that off. And it seems like there's no um there's no qualms about it. They're, they're, they're like, all right, this is the direction we're moving. This is how things are going. And the fact that other platforms are are like taken after Twitter. Now we got Meta. Do you think that there's going to be more platforms that do something like that? Yeah, I mean, that's just how it always works. Everybody tries to steal everybody's thing. Yeah. Like everybody, like, you know, of course, we like TikTok. You have YouTube Shorts, Instagram Reels, Snapchat Spotlight. Like everybody's going to do everything that's working for somebody else. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm sure TikTok would like to do it, but they got a lot of other stuff to worry about right now. So we'll see. I'm sure they're going to roll it out before the they're end of the year. True. At the beginning, <laughs> for a period of time, I know that would, like when we were doing those campaigns heavy in like 2020, because it just made you feel too, like it was like you were old or official and everybody wanted to feel like they were building it themselves, yeah. you know? Yeah. Cause that's why uh, TikTok was like a better platform. It was like more influencer based. It's like growing influencers rather than like focusing on celebrities. Like it was more relatable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. People like to follow influencers. Yeah, we're saying better platform for influencer relatability. I will argue since early YouTube. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I agree like for sure. sure. Yeah. The whole like lifestyle clout era. Yeah. Kind of took over. Do, you, <laughs> do you think that's changed? Like, has the culture changed much on TikTok to you? Um, as far as like what? Just from let's say from twenty twenty to now, what are the changes that you've seen in terms of how the culture interacts with content in general? Um, it's like super different from I think people in like the twenty twenties and stuff like that. They used to like champion influencers, like and like those people. They really wanted to like they latched onto them and wanted to see them grow. Mm-hmm. Um, I think TikTok is now become it still has those people that's like finding their way and it's like more relatable and a lot of the content that you want to see but it's a lot more saturated and people like especially with these big creators focus on like the drama that they would focus on on like the instagram places and stuff like that it's not as bad but it's still becoming one of those things where the influencers that are super are super big are now looked at kind of as celebrities and have those same problems that those instagram celebrities have Okay, okay, and yeah, it's interesting how you said they champion influencers before, or like champion people becoming influencers. Yeah, like we're gonna help you grow and become this thing. And it seems like now, like that culture has been set and it's matured. Where I don't know, people are low key jealous, right? Yeah. Like, like I, I want to be that influencer. It's no more competitive. Where I don't want to let anybody else be as big as me anymore. Exactly. Like it's more. Uh, it went from like, everything's free. So now, all right, we're 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 any other platform, like you said. So, with that being said, how do you hmm, how do I ask this? How do you view independent labels versus distribution companies? I think uh, distribution companies are more trying to be independent labels now independent labels are more like trying to be labels now if that uh makes sense i don't think independent labels are actually independent anymore um like they're just not like (laughs) most of them are all in joint ventures at least the ones that you as most artists want to sign to and then distribution companies they like to call themselves distribution companies but they offer label services for the artists that they actually want to do that for so it's like it's technically like an independent label because it's like you have the resources there even with an independent label you're not giving those resources to somebody that you didn't all you're really doing for them is distribution because you don't have as much money as a label to give everybody a certain amount of budget 
usually with independent labels, it's like, okay, if you're really like growing um, and really like early, we're gonna give you a distribution style deal. Um, and so like, that's the same as a distribution company where it's like, but majority of the people get, I mean, honestly, even at independent labels, majority of the people get distribution style deals unless they're a bigger artist. And if they, and that's if it's a independent label that cares more about like maintaining your rights. Cause some people will give you a 360 deal and like a, a, a major label style deal where they take ownership of your masters, but still not give you really any money. <laughs> so it just really depends on like what you negotiate. You might be lucky and get a distribution deal if they really want to work with you. Or if you don't really have like good lawyers and stuff like that, you get that major major label style deal where they take ownership of your masters, but still don't give you any money. Um, but yeah, like distribution companies is like essentially the same thing as independent labels. Yeah, I've, I've definitely noticed that. And it's like the way I describe it is is like the new finesse. Yeah. Right? Majors realize, oh, they look at us as bad. Exactly. So we're gonna send out these other soldiers, literally funnel them and bring them back home exactly. undetected. Right. And it's it's interesting now knowing that, right? And seeing that from inside and outside at this point. How do you view, let's just say you had your own artist, right? Whether you're a manager or his or his label. Uh, you have your own artist. Are you in favor of one type of agreement or one type of system over the other? Or like, how would you build infrastructure? So for me, um, I'm going to give you three different. I, I, I wear a lot of different hats, right? So if I were to like have a label, I would do more like the master style deals because I would be trying to like invest in the artists and break them and do all of that stuff and be spending a lot of my time and resources um to make that work right um as an a and r and plus like on the label side it's like you're making an investment it's like and if you're investing a lot of artists you really want to see that work if i'm especially like if you let's say you do a joint venture with a major label it's like you have to like report to them and make sure like you're having wins and making money and they're not just throwing away money and if you're spending your own money as an independent label, you don't have that much money to spend. So again, you need to make sure that there's money coming in. So you have to structure types of deals that you give out in a certain way. Um, at Streamcut, they were, our co-founders used to be like, they're still entertainment lawyers, but they were entertainment lawyers for like 10 plus years or so. Um, and they created their independent label favorably for artists, whereas they didn't take ownership of any masters because they saw artists getting into like, really bad deals and labels doing a lot of these like horrible deals. So that's why they created Stream Cut. And so to benefit there, we did more of these like distribution style deals or like um, profit split type deals. And as an A&R makes you feel a lot better about having these conversations of signing artists. And it, it makes you be able to sign an artist you want to work with and, and see them grow and everybody's fine and you don't have as much issues in those earlier phases. So as an A&R, I kind of prefer that model um but it doesn't make sense for like as far as like a major label to do that because mm -hmm. they don't have to do it yeah so yeah, yeah, yeah. it just depends i mean for the, some artists they give like those deals where they do like profit splits but you have to be really like big but yeah. i get it if i'm in like the hat like if it's my label i'm going for a major label style but as like an a and r deal prefer that type of style yeah i mean i think you know we demonize certain models but either way it goes it just has to make sense yeah. all the way around right it's like oh well if i don't have a percentage of this or i don't have a piece of this or i don't have a piece of this and you want this much money right then you can't expect that much money actually exactly yeah. <laughs> or you can't expect this much effort like the yeah. incentive isn't there the way my life is set up and the way the deal is set up mm -hmm. or okay i have a greater piece well man if you want a greater piece let's say you want a piece of the master well, on the out artist side, well, then I'm expecting this much money or effort, exactly. right? And prioritization in your life, right? So if that comes, then great, just like any other business, right? Oh, if you actually do grow the business from, you know, 500K to 50 million, then all right, that might it make a out lot of you. sense, right? Yeah. But if I'm only getting a, a certain piece, and I and I don't actually own any of the main thing. Mm -hmm. Shoot, my incentive to grow it from 500k to 50 million 
shit, as hard as it is, I, yeah. I could go make that money somewhere else. Exactly. Right? And I don't think artists see it that way. I think the problem with a lot of artists, too, when it comes to, like, having these conversation deals, they always think that, like, somebody's negatively out to get them, but they don't think of the other side. Like, yeah. you haven't really built leverage. So, like, you're looking at, oh, I'm supposed to get these type of deals because this is what I see on the internet. But how much money does your music actually generate for you currently? Mm-hmm. Like, what do you make in a month off of your streams? What do you make in a year off of your streams? Now, why would I pay you X amount of dollars? Why am I paying you a million dollars um, and give you ownership to your masters when it doesn't even make you a thousand dollars a month? Yeah. yeah. That doesn't make any sense. Yeah. <laughs> like, that doesn't make any sense. So, I mean, it's, it's really about kind of thinking about that. And like, before you even try to get towards a major label deal, building that leverage to where you can really come in there and ask for what you want. I think a lot of people should really like build some leverage, go to an independent label or a distribution company that's like better than the average. Like, cause you start off with a, like a TuneCore or whatever, or DistroKid, right? Mm-hmm. Cool, you build your leverage. Maybe you then look at distribution companies or independent labels to take it to a next step. And then from there, you can look at like a major label and there you're gonna get the best possible deal, I think. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I guess it comes down to this era having the advantage of hearing so much information. But the problem is all this information doesn't apply to everybody's situation. Exactly. Right. And it really should always just be about the deal that makes sense for you at the table. Now, the problem only becomes when the deal that makes sense for you. In your mind is just based off of like lack of education. So, yeah. so it could sound like it makes sense. And then it's like, ah, no, that did you actually got into a bad deal. Yeah. Right. That, that's a that's a whole nother thing. Um, or on the other side, you're judging it the wrong way where you don't think it makes sense for you. And you think somebody's trying to get at you. But like mm-hmm. you said, you don't understand the other side of the table and why it makes sense all the way around. All right. Because there are people who do get into those deals that are highly favorable on paper, but then they are unhappy with the work that ever gets put behind them. Right. And that's the, that's another thing that people don't realize with a lot of these labels. It's like, if you get this very generous deal towards you, a lot of the times, and it depends again on who you are and where you're at. It's like, why would I invest so much into you? If like, we basically are in a 50, 50, like, I'm going to just do as much work as you do, or I might not invest that much because I don't see as much return as, as as I might get from an artist that's in a 360 deal. Like, if I blow this artist up, we get nice checks. If I blow you up, it's like, that's cool, but I'm not really seeing much return on that. Because it's the same shit. <laughs> it's the same shit that artists are trying to advance and build leverage for, right? That yeah. same idea of why would I go to a label when I cannot have a label and make less money uh, on top line, but still take home more. Yeah. Right. It's the same thing. Well, why would I get in this deal with this artist when I can make less money <laughs> over here with this other artist and still take home more? It's exactly. the same concept. So you should just think about it that way. Keep it simple. Like everybody's trying to make the most money they can with the least amount of effort. Doesn't mean that nobody wants to work hard, but if I know that I'm going to work hard regardless. I want to make as much money as I can yeah. for that hard work. <laughs> and if you're worth that. Hey, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So um like I would I would like to hear just kind of like closing things out with you. Like where do you think the industry is going like more so with AI? AI is going to have some massive impact on the music industry. For real, for real, over the next year, or do you think it's a little further along? Um, personally, what I think with AI, um, and this is gonna be kind of a problem more so for the fans than labels. Uh, I think that like you know how like we have like a lot of posthumous releases, like when artists die. I think instead of only relying on like the songs that they made before they died, and even like just like the roughs and all of that type of stuff. I think they're going to take it a step further of making records with the AI voice and the fans wouldn't know. And they will just be allowed to make not I don't know, I wouldn't say allowed, but they would just put out more projects and make more money off that artist and probably try to renegotiate deals with that artist's estate to put out more projects with AI voice, but making it to where it's like you really think it's this artist. Like it really sounds like the music that they make because the voice is already there. It just got to like sound like how they sound. 
I mean, like as far as like the lyrics and stuff and the melodies and stuff. And I think that's what labels are going to do because it's going to make them more money. But it'll be bad for fans. Bro, I'm, I'm glad you said that because I hadn't heard that perspective yet. <laughs> like, obviously, we know that there's a lot of situations where these records are going to be created for mm -hmm. sure that fans don't know. Yeah. Right. If it's somebody, because it could just be a random kid in the room. I make this record that sounds like Kendrick Lamar, mm -hmm. and then people don't know they're actually not Kendrick Lamar. Right. Yeah. But if you have a situation where everybody is in on it, all the official people, the record label, the yeah. estate, then truly, yeah, I might. I the the lie will never be uh, you know revealed. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. That's crazy. And you know, knowing how these labels move, <laughs> I do not. I do not doubt that one bit. And knowing how, you know, you know, some estates might be like, hey, well, we might as well. Cause we, yeah. we own the likeness, right? We we own the like whatever else is required, right? Yeah. To be able to do that. And it's it would technically be legal. Exactly. It's just the fans who just would be really mad know. about it. But and they wouldn't even be mad about it because they wouldn't really know. But right. It just comes down That's to do crazy. and does anybody care enough? Like, or they what do you like kind of value more? And I think. Just generally speaking with businesses, it's a business, so if it makes money and you can get away with it, cool. Bring your life back to the, you know, the IP, in a sense. Yeah. Yeah, that's all it life technically life. is. Yeah. It technically is just bringing life back to the IP because we, we do that with movies and, you know, other type of images, cartoons, and things like that. Yeah. Technically, it would just be that. Right, because all those things are art forms. I think we associate music a little bit like yeah. more personally, but re technically it's just that, yeah. and it's just an uneasy thing that we're probably gonna have to get over. Because I mean, when you kind of even think about it and look at artists like Juice World, it's like I think he's at this point they've released like three or four projects after like he's been dead, mm -hmm. and I know like there's been the stories of how he's like he used to record so much music, so I know like he's probably like, had so much music to, like go from. Mm -hmm. But at one point, do you be like? At, like you know, at, like let's say on the seventh, eighth, ninth project of like releasing his music, when do you kind of think about it? Like, mm, yeah, is is this still like his drafts? Still him? <laughs> yeah, see, that's that whole thing. That's when you get into conspiracies. Like, oh yeah, they're gonna they starting to build that he works all the time. Step <laughs> <Step> number one, <laughs> so it could be believable. They trying to create it, make it seem. Yeah, no. <laughs> wow, wow. Yeah, man, that's a great take. That's a great take, and and that would be interesting, very interesting to uh to see. Is there anything that you feel like uh we should look out for going on with you going on this next year? Or, or? um, no, I'm just gonna continue to work. Uh, work, just continue to work. That's all I can do. All right. I feel it. I feel it, man. Appreciate you stopping by, Patrick. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Should I tell everybody where to follow you? Uh yeah, you can follow me on Instagram at patrick.mgb. Patrick.mgb. Y'all check yeah. him out. Yep, this is yet another episode of No Labels Necessary podcast. I'm Brandman Sean. I'm Corey. <laughs> and we out.